I know some of you feel like, oh, th- uh, you know, some of you probably are feeling, man, I've already been to church. I, you know, <laughs> let her go, Pastor. I said, all right. All right, I got you. I understand how you feel. <clears throat> but I believe the Lord has just a little bit more to say to us because uh, sound, sound doctrine. I know, like I was saying at some point earlier in the service, that the word doctrine, usually, you know, when you say the word, people's eyes kind of shut because it's like, oh, my God, you know, what is he talking about? Doctrine, that's one of those, that's one of those uh, religious words. You know, this has become a buzzword, really. And, and it's funny because, I, you know, I, I'm kind of hammer on these happiness boys and stuff. You can watch them on TV, you know, all you want to. I mean, they're just, they, and, and, and they, actually, they actually themselves say, we're, you know, we, get on, we don't preach on doctrine and we don't preach. And so you don't hear things about sin and hell and, 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 and the resurrection and the blood of Jesus and stuff like that because those are convicting terms. Those are terms that make you a little uncomfortable at times. And a lot of people don't like to be made uncomfortable. And so... People don't preach, and they're actually proud of it, you know, and say, well, this, I don't preach on doctrine. Well, yeah, I know. That's why the people don't have any idea of what you're supposed to believe and why you're supposed to believe it. I mean, they, they just kind of aimless, and it makes, them, makes you sit in ducks for the enemy because somehow the enemy will convince you that you can, you know, work your way to heaven or you can, you can do enough good to counteract the bad, and, and that's just a fancy way of saying you know, if I can do the, all of these things, then God's going to let me in, so to speak. And there, there are whole churches and denominations nowadays that are full of people that are trying to do good stuff in order to get to heaven. Now, I'm not against doing good stuff. Look at your neighbor and say, we like that. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying that you ought not do good stuff. But remember, the, the Lord says, it's not because you do good stuff. It's because I'm living in your heart. And that, and that the come to me comes before the go out and do, right? You got to come to him first, then you're compelled by the Spirit to go out and do. So good deeds are not bad things, but you have to get it in the proper perspective. You, you do good things not in order to be saved. You do good things because you are saved. The reason we want to help and, and minister and, and be comforting and, and be used by the Holy Spirit is not in order to get somewhere, but because Christ has entered our heart, now we're motivated by him to do these things. So the calm always precedes the go, and you have to keep it in the right perspective. Well, those thoughts, that's doctrine. I, I don't know if you're aware of that. I hope you don't grow weary, and I'm going to try to move on through. I've been preaching a long time on every one of these and I appreciate you hanging in there, and I hope you don't grow weary. Just to, just, to, just to help you just a little bit, in about three weeks, and I know three weeks. Well, we have, this is the fourth church, and there's seven of them, so there are three more after this one. They all have a purpose. Believe me, if you can hang on through these seven churches, you're going to have a basis for which the rest of the book of Revelation is going to be much more meaningful and powerful for you. You'll begin, to, you'll begin to grab on to some of these concepts that, that get introduced in these seven churches that will carry all the way throughout the book, the 22 chapters of Revelation. You say, why do we study the book of Revelation? Because Revelation means to open up, to uncover, to, re, to reveal. And I know a lot of people are saying, man, I know what it reveals. It reveals these Star Wars things. It reveals these, you know, the, the, these, these bombastic, uh, you know, out of this world experiences like, like we've never seen before. And you get all wrapped up in the science of fiction and, the, and, the, and the, you know, all of these weird figures and these crazy things that are going on in the book of Revelation. But it, it, it's not, the book is not intended to entertain you with some bizarre pictures of what might happen in this world. The first verse of the book of Revelation tells you in the first few words exactly what Revelation is all about. It says, this is the revelation of, tell me the next two words, Jesus Christ. What does that mean? It means this book is going to reveal Jesus Christ. This book is not going to reveal the Holy Spirit. That's not what it's for. It's not to reveal these weird and wonderful Star Wars games. It's not going to reveal what happens at the end of the age and all of that kind of stuff. It's going to reveal Jesus Christ. 
So what it reveals about Jesus is, what is Jesus doing in the future? What is Jesus going to be all about at the end of time? What do we need to know about Jesus Christ and how do we need to see Jesus Christ in everything that's going to happen uh, just a few short uh, decades, days, hours, who knows when it you know, might begin. We don't know the day or the hour, the Bible says, and, and none of us know that, uh, not even the Son of God. I mean, he knows it now, but he didn't know, why, didn't know it while he's here on earth. Uh, he said, even, even the angels don't know. Even the Son of Man doesn't know. So, I mean, you know, nobody knows. Could happen before we leave this service today. Could happen this afternoon before you eat lunch. Could happen 100 years from now. I, I'm, not, I'm not prophesying that, you know, it's going to happen in the next few hours. I'm just telling you that whenever it does start happening, it's going to begin to pick up the pace and boom, 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 boom. So does the book of Revelation. In chapter 4, if you can hang on, we're in chapter 2. You know, we'll begin chapter 3 next week and the next week and, and a few a few of the churches, three churches are there and you'll see that. But when we hit chapter four, you're going to heaven. Look at your neighbor and say, I love to go to heaven. <laughs> in chapter four, I'm just telling you, if you'll hang on, it'll be worth it. And we're going to heaven in chapter four. Praise the Lord. We'll not be looking at things from the perspective of earth. In chapters two and three, you know what they're about? The things that are. Jesus said, you know, what I want to, you know what I want to show you? I want to show you how things are. I showed you myself in chapter 1 what used to be. You know, you used to see Jesus, the glorified Christ. Now in chapters 2 and 3, I'm going to use seven churches to tell you how things are. How is it on the earth right now? What is the spiritual condition of the earth? What is happening in the body of Christ right now on the earth? And then beginning at chapter 4, let me show you the things that are going to be hereafter. And he says, first thing he says is, uh, John says, and I was in the Spirit of the Lord, and the Spirit said, come up hither. In other words, come on to heaven, John. Let me show you now from heaven's point of view what heaven's going to be doing to reveal Jesus Christ in the last days. And that's when it gets a little bit uh, bizarre, you know, and Man, this book is filled with some, if you've, if you've read it, if you've said, look at it, I mean, just see what we're going to be doing. Uh, you're probably going, what's that and what's that and why did he say that? And my goodness, I've never heard of that. What is that? Well, God's going to reveal these things because that's why he put them in there. He didn't put them in there to confuse you or to hide them from you. A lot of people think you can't understand the book of Revelation. I'm telling you, you can I'm telling you that God wants you to understand the book. And that's why he's opened it up in these days. There were a lot of things. Man, I started preaching in the 70s, the early 70s. I know <laughs> it's shocking, but I, I, you know, I, I am pretty, pretty old. But uh, uh, by the way, just a word of like a little uh, maybe entertainment for you. We moved one of our, our really older church members this week, and uh, the little crew that did it, I was part of the little crew, and myself and Joe plays the guitar over here just to show you we were the young guys on the crew. Yeah, yeah. We were the ones that handled the heavy stuff because we didn't want the other guys to kind of hurt themselves and that kind of stuff. And so I felt, I felt young. You know, I said, I'm one of the, I'm one of the, the young guys, you know, <laughs> which, gives you a whole, which teaches you who I hang out with a lot of times. You know? I mean, you know, it does matter. You know, a bunch of old folks, but, but that's all right. That's all right. God can still use us, and he speaks to us. Now, Thyatira is the fourth church that we have been to. You remember the first church was Ephesus, and what was the problem at Ephesus? The problem at Ephesus was they had good sound teaching. They had good sound doctrine. They were ministered to by the greatest leaders the church had. Aquila and Priscilla, the great husband and wife team that taught the word of God, was there. Apollos who was, you heard the Apostle Paul talked about a lot. He was a flaming orator. He was like a Billy Graham of his day, tremendous evangelist for God. He ministered there at Ephesus. Then you got the Apostle Paul. The church was founded by the Apostle Paul, and he stays there for almost three years. That's a long time. He was taught by the, they were taught by the greatest. And then Timothy, his young preacher boy that Paul actually mentored and taught, came to be their first pastor. So they had tremendously sound doctrine. What was their problem? Their problem was, though they had sound teaching, their hearts had begun to lose the love that they had for Christ. 
They didn't turn reprobate. They didn't turn non-believer. They just slowly lost the love that they had for Christ. So even though they believed the right things, their heart was turning cold. At Smyrna, what was going on there? Well, the church was persecuted and suffering. You remember? They had martyrs there at Smyrna, and the government, the oppressive hand of the government was mashing them down. And every time they seemed to take a step forward, somebody, some, some Jewish you know, heathen, basically, of the government would rat them out to the Roman government and say, you won't believe what they're doing down there. And then some wing of the government, the IRS, the you know, uh, the in multiple FBI, CIA, what, all these alphabet agencies of the Roman government will say, well, let's go down there and do an investigation. And all it did was harass them, belittle them, and keep them under the wing. So the government moved against the church, and the church couldn't do what it was supposed to do. It was broke and penniless and beggars on the street, and it was put down and persecuted on every hand. And then we last week went to the church at Pergamos, and Pergamos was <coughs> where the church and, and, and the government actually married each other. You remember this? Now, the church is not intended to be married to the government. When that happens, basically what happens is the church unites itself, spiritually speaking, and weds itself to the government instead of to God, and when that starts happening, then the church actually submits itself to the little G, the little God of this world. And of course, all kinds of crazy things begin happening in the church, no sound teaching, no sound understanding, and the church begins to go down this path of being worldly and indifferent to the things of God, and it just gets led further and further and further away from the things of Christ. Well, today at Thyatira, you have the child that is born. If, if Pergamos was a church where, where the world and the church married each other, then Thyatira is the offspring of that marriage. There, the, 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 the church and, and the government had a baby, and that baby's name is Thyatira. And Thyatira's problem was that they had totally lost the Spirit of God, that they had totally walked away. This is the church of the dark ages, and I don't want to be too historical here because I know some of you, as soon as I mention some history term, your eyes roll back in your head because you go, oh my, I don't care about history. Well, that's fine. There's no problem, but I just want to show you if in the dark ages, about 600 to 1500, that's a long time. Look at your neighbor and say, that's a long time. That's a long time. This church, Thyatira, lasted for the whole uh, dark ages. And, and during the dark ages, what happened? Well, the church just basically married itself to the world, and the world, a church had a baby, and the baby was Thyatira, and they just kept walking further and further and further and further away. And uh, you'll see the problem was Jezebelism, and you might say, what in the world is that? I just recognize that's a bad name. Well, we'll talk about it in a second. But that was really what, what, what happened there. And so let's read what the Lord says. By the way, this is the longest of all the letters. This is there, you know, you'll, you'll see it. Uh, there's more. To, Jesus says more to Thyatira in words than any of the other churches. The other churches are four or five verses or so. This is a few more verses. Look at what he says. And to the angel, everybody say, Pastor. It's what the word means, or messenger. Whoever it is that's leading the church, he said, send them a letter. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira, write, these things say the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know your works, your love, your service, your faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel. Because <laughs> you allow that woman Jezebel. Let me just say that the, the phrase that woman Jezebel could be easily translated and, and some do translate it, translate it, thy woman Jezebel. In other words, one, this, this is your woman. This is one of your people. This is one of the people that are your your offspring or your mate or your lover. This is, this is somebody you chose. You allow your woman Jezebel. So it's implying that there's a woman in the church who is leading the church and she has control of the church and she's moving the church. 
So the problem at, at Thyatira has to do with a woman, a woman who's in the church, who's leading the church. Now, don't get all whacked out on that. I just want you to know that that's the problem. And he says, what I have against you is because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things that are sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death. That doesn't sound nice, does it? That sounds pretty harsh. Everybody think this is judgment, not grace. When you hear Jesus say, I'm going to kill her children, you go, whoo, that's not nice. No, it's not nice. The reason why is because grace is over and judgment has begun. So he says, I'm going to kill her children with death and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts and I'll give each one of you according to your works. Now to you I say and to the rest of Thyatira as many as do not have this doctrine who have not known the depths of Satan as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the, over the enemy. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, and they shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, as I also have received from my father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Do you have your ears on, good buddy? An old, this is an old sea beers term. Yeah, I came up with the sea beers. Does anybody still CB nowadays? I mean, you know, I know some people do. They like this. But basically the term would, the Lord's looking at you and say, you got your ears on, good buddy. If you got your ears on, are you hearing what I'm saying? And he speaks all these things to the church at Thyatira. What in the world would God be saying to us? Now, I want you to understand that even though this was a real church, and we all know this, this a church actually existed. It was really here on the earth in Asia Minor. Asia Minor is a, a, a place over uh, in, in Asia, so a little area basically that is the country of Turkey today, generally speaking, that's Asia Minor. And there were seven of these churches that you start here, you got Ephesus, you got Smyrna, you got Pergamos, now you got Thyatira, and then next week you got Sardis, and then you got Philadelphia, and then you got Laodicea. They're kind of like a little circle looking deal if you look at them on the map. And the Lord writes one letter to each of them to tell us how it is. So even though this is a real letter written to a real church, I want you to just kind of pat yourself like this. Do, do just like this and say, this is a word to me. This is a word to me. This is not just some historical writing to some church that used to be. God is revealing something to you. Why would he keep these letters to these churches in the word of God? Because he wants you to see yourself and, to, and, to, and, and that you can be revealed by what he says these things are about. So this is not just some word to some historical church. This is a current word to you. And though these churches might have, this might have been the general testimony of the churches. The churches also had great people. Not everybody in the church was like is described here because you heard him say, man, some of you have not followed this teaching. Some of you, even in this kind of place, have not swallowed this craziness and you're not going that way. You still, you still honor Christ and you still seek him. So I'm just saying to you, uh, keep on doing what you do and stay out of harm's way and wait, I'm coming. And when I come, I'll take care of this. You just keep your head down, keep your nose clean and keep going. You know, he didn't ask him to do the impossible. He didn't say, look, you tiny little, you know, you tiny little spot in the church, put yourself in harm's way, get out there and challenge all this, go to the deacon's meeting and raise a ruckus or stand up in the middle of the church and tell them they're all a bunch of heathen and hypocrites. He said, no, he said, don't put yourself in harm's way. He didn't ask them to do the impossible. He looked at them and said, there are not enough of you. you, you, you you're not going to change this. So I'm just going to say to you, Keep your head down, keep your nose clean, keep on doing what you're doing, work the works, try to reach who you can and, and, and know that one of these days I'm coming and I'm going to rescue you and this other bunch is going to get what they deserve. 
Everybody say, get their comeuppance. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hey, look, there's a payday someday. R.G. Lee, one of the great preachers of my generation, when I was young, man, he was a firebrand evangelist out of Tennessee. He preached a sermon called Payday Someday. It was about Jezebel and Ahab in the Bible, and, uh, and, and, and the great title was Payday Someday. Look, there's a payday someday, I'm telling you that, Right? You know, even though it's on the charge right now, there's going to be a payday someday. <laughs> I hope I didn't make some of you kind of lose your glory because you're thinking of your own finances. Yeah, there, there is a payday out there someday. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, there is spiritually too, and there are a lot of people that seemingly are getting away with sin and rebellion and unrighteousness and wickedness and all of the negative things, and they look like they're fat, happy, and sassy. It looks like everything is going their way. But the book of Revelation wants to reveal to you that there comes a time when that is over. Say, the party's over. And here it is, and here's Jesus revealing it to us. And so let's look real quickly, Thyatira, just one little tiny word. Thyatira is a place that's mentioned in the New Testament of the Bible besides the book of Revelation. It's mentioned when a woman named Lydia, you might remember this from Acts 16, I put it in your notes, there's a, I, I just want you to know this because it might have a little bearing on what the church was about. Uh, Lydia, in Acts 16, was a woman who came down and heard the Apostle Paul teaching when he was at a little city called Philippi. And at Philippi, where the letter to the Philippians is the letter to that church, at Philippi, he's teaching down by the riverbanks, and this woman just happens to be among the people listening. And she starts hearing, and the Holy Spirit convicts her that she needs to give her heart to Christ. And so she comes to the Apostle Paul and says, I want to make Jesus Lord of my life. And he said, well, uh, pray this prayer with me and mean, mean this to the Lord, and he'll save your soul. And she does. And then she says, you know, you guys are traveling evangelists, and you probably need some place to stay while you're here. So come down to my house and, and stay while you're ministering in the city and trying to do your work. And the Bible tells us that Lydia was the first convert to Christianity in the whole continent of Asia. And she lived in the city of Thyatira, although she did business over in Philippi, where the book of Acts is talking about receiving the Lord. But she's actually from Thyatira, and she's a seller of purple linen, which is, which is one of the things that Thyatira is known for. They manufactured this beautiful purple garment. And so she is a citizen of that, and I'm just saying to you that she might have had a role in the starting of the church at Thyatira. Because she was the first Christian, she might have, and I'm just saying might, there's no evidence of this, and I'm not trying to, you know, be, uh, circum- to be speculative about it, but it just, just kind of as a thought, she, she might have had a testimony, you know, when somebody from your city comes to the Lord, and they're excited about it, and they see all these unique things, man, you know what she saw? While Paul and Silas were living at her house, going out and ministering, you know what one of the first things that happened? One of the first things that happened in the city, and she watched this happen, she was there, is that there was this little demon-possessed girl that followed the apostle Paul and Silas around all day. Everywhere they went, she went. And you know what she did? She was a distraction to what Paul and them were doing. She kept saying out loud, these men are men called by the most high God. These men are men. And you say, man, what a good testimony. Yeah, but they couldn't preach. I mean, they've got this little screech eagle demon back here behind them going, these men are the most high God. Well, Paul took, put up with that for a day or two, and then he finally turned around and looked at her and commanded the demon in her to be gone. Out of here. And all of a sudden, she couldn't, she couldn't do anymore. She couldn't tell fortunes. She couldn't do her old crazy demonic ministry. And the people that owned her got all angry about that, drug Paul and Silas out in front of the city, and the men of the city got mad. They said, look, we can't do our merchandise anymore. These guys are shaking up our whole city. And the guys of the town ripped their clothes off of them, started beating them with lashes and so forth, took them and threw them into jail. And that night, God made the jailhouse rock. How many of you have heard of the, of the earthquake and the, and the Philippian jailer 
coming at that morning, he's going to kill himself because he thinks, man, all the prisoners have escaped. And the apostle Paul said, hey, wait, do yourself no harm, man. We're all here. And the Philippian jailer fell on his knees and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? The apostle Paul led him to Christ and then he took, the jailer took Paul home with him and his whole family comes to Christ and all of them are baptized. Well, Lydia saw all this. Lydia was part of all this. And I'm sure she probably wrote back to some of her friends in Thyatira and said, man, you won't believe what has happened to me and all of the things that I've seen. And she probably tried to write about some of those things. And when her friends received it, they said, oh, my goodness, would that the Spirit of God would come to Thyatira like that. And they might have gotten a little group together and said, can you send one of those guys that know about Christ to kind of help us? And that might have been the birth of the church. Who knows? I'm just saying that there's a possibility that the first convert in Asia actually had part of forming a church called Thyatira, the city that she lived in. So this woman, I mean, this church may have been founded by a woman. Now that's neither here nor there, but the fact that the problem in a church was a woman is not here or there because that's the problem in the church. There's a woman who seemingly has control of what happens in this church and she has ill will and ill intentions and she's totally seductive in every way, and she somehow has a stranglehold on the leadership of this church. So who is it that starts speaking to this church? You know, and I've said to you that, that it matters what Jesus says because it shows you what he's all about, and he, he usually reveals himself back in something he said before. But look, and to the angel of the church at Thyatira, these things say the Son of God. I just want to make you aware that back in the first chapter of Revelation, which, you know, obviously this phrase refers back to, all right, you remember in the first chapter, this is who I said I was. I just want to reiterate this right now, but he uses a different term. Now, follow me just a second. Back in chapter one, when he introduces himself, he calls himself the son of man. If you read back like verse, chapter one, verse 13, 40, something right around in there, You'll see when he's describing himself, he says, the son of man. Now he calls himself the son of God. What's the difference? Well, the phrase, term, son, the term son of man is his identification with man. In other words, Jesus looks at you and he says, I'm the son of man. What he's saying is, I understand what it means to be you. I empathize with you. I know the difficulty you have and the trouble. I know, I know how hard it is on you in this world because I, I'm the son of man. In other words, I experience what you experience. I walk through what you walk through. I know what it's like to be tempted. And does he know? Yeah, one of the first things that happened after he gave himself into ministry when he's, all, you know, when he's 30 years old as the son of God is he separates himself for 40 days and 40 nights out in the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And the devil took him to a high place and the devil said, command these stones be made bread and all the kingdoms of the world are yours. If you'll worship me, cast yourself down off the temple because the angels are going to catch you and you're not going to hurt yourself. I mean, those are tremendous temptations just like we face. And so as the son of man, he's basically look at him and said, I, I, I feel for you. I, I, I understand where you're coming from. From So the term son of man would be an empathetic way of God saying, I identify with you. But now look in this verse, he's not identifying himself as a son of man. He says, I'm the son of God. What is the difference there? Well, the son of God means he's coming in wrath. The son of God means I'm no longer that gentle son of man. Uh, uh, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. You have, you have committed spiritual adultery. You've turned your back on me for the last time. You spit on me. You separated on, from me. You rejected me for the last time. And now I'm coming in judgment. I'm not the sympathetic, empathetic son of man. I'm the son of God that's coming back to judge you. So he says, these things says the son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire, penetrating. A flame, a flame consumes everything that it, that it, that it meets. It destroys, it overwhelms, it burns up, it, 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 it consumes everything. So like a penetrating flame of fire that sees right to the heart of your soul. Jesus is looking at you and he's saying, I see you and I see what's going on inside of you. I know who you are. I know what you're doing. I know what you're about. 
And so as the son of God, I'm coming back and I can see what I need to do in your life. And, and his feet were like fine brass. Feet represent submission. I wrote it in your notes for you. Every time uh, a citizen of Rome would come to a ruler to beg for mercy, he would bow at, that, at, at the foot of the throne, basically submitting himself to the sovereign leadership of whoever that, and, and begging for mercy. So feet in ancient manuscripts represent submission to judgment. In other words, he's saying, my feet are like brass. Brass always represents judgment in prophetic words. I'm going to break you to pieces. I'm going to crush you. I'm going to smash you. So I'm the son of God who has fiery eyes that can see everything. And, I ha and, and it's not my aim now to, to redeem you. It's my aim for you to get your comeuppance because I'm coming back as the son of God. Look, it's amazing that one of these days this is what's going to happen. Well, look, in, in the midst of a church like this that I'm describing to you that that has no sound doctrine, it's not going in the right direction, it doesn't believe the right things, it's being seduced away from Christ. I mean, you, it's amazing that he could find anything good to say about this church. But he does find something good. Look, look, look. Verse 19, I know your works. I know how many of you are aware, you've been here, this is the fourth message you've heard to a church. How many of you are realizing that the first thing he says to every one of these churches is, I know your works? You, have you seen that? When you pray and you say, Lord, do you know what's happening to me? Lord, do you know what, what I'm going through? Do you know where I am? I would just say to you, by the testimony of these seven churches, the first thing that the Lord would say to you is, I know where you are. I know your works. <laughs> you say, I need the Lord to go ahead of me. Well, he already knows this. He's already there. He's already working there. He knows where you're going. He knows where you've been, and he knows where you are. He sees you. And so he says to the church, I know your works, and I know your love, and I know your service, and I know your faith, and I know your patience. And, and, and as for your works, the last are greater than the first. In other words, he says, look, I know that even in this crazy, messed up, upside down church that some of you still love me. You, you're still walking. You're trying to walk for me. You're trying to minister. You're trying to do everything right. And it takes a great love for me, and it takes a tremendous patience. You have to be totally patient, and I see it, and I know where you are, and my eyes are on you, and I, I haven't forgotten about you, and I know that you are there, and I know that you're working hard to try to uh, create an environment where people can come to me, and, and, you, and you're working hard because uh, you're, the last of you is greater than the first of you. So his word of encouragement was, even at this mixed up, backwards, upside down, crazy uh, church that is walking away from Christ in every way, there are still a few who still know him, which is a testimony to the grace of God that there would be anybody that could make it through all of the defects and, 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 and malcontents and everything that were there. So he says, what's right with you? You know, you're patient. I got some good things to say about you. This really has to do with service more than anything else. You're doing the right thing. You're going in the right direction. But realize service is not how you get to God. Service is because you came to God. So there we go. So what's wrong? Nevertheless, he says, I have a few things against you. And this is where he starts saying, okay, what's right with the church? You got some people that love me. All right, what's wrong with the church? Well, what's wrong with the church is uh, you allow that woman Jezebel. Who is Jezebel, by the way? When you hear that name, Jezebel, it kind of makes your skin crawl a little, doesn't it? Because everybody, if you've heard anything about the Bible, generally you've heard the name Jezebel, right? Whether we're the Old Testament or New Testament, anytime her name is mentioned in the Bible, it's not good, Right? This is why people don't name their daughters Jezebel. Have you ever heard of anybody named Jezebel? Now, don't raise your hand and tell us who it is. You probably, in this crazy world we live in, some infidel might have named their child Jezebel. But I don't think, I can't think, I've never heard anybody name their daughter Jezebel. Uh, they name their dog Jezebel sometime, but they... The name Jezebel has almost been wiped off the pages of uh, human practice because of the wickedness of Jezebel. Everybody has heard about Jezebel. Who was Jezebel? Well, she was a queen in the Old Testament. She was married to the king named Ahab. 
You might remember Elijah, the prophet that called fire from heaven, and then the prophets of Baal, he killed 450 of those, 400 of those and 450 prophets of the groves because they were trying to seduce the people to serve Baal. Well, that was when Jezebel was queen. R.G. Lee, I, I, you know, I mentioned him before, he, he preached a sermon that was real famous in my day. I've heard it, you know, I don't know, 50 times. I loved it. It was kind of one of those old-time orator-type words. And he had a great phrase, and listen to the phrase. Listen to how he described Jezebel and Ahab. Jezebel was a headstrong heathen woman that led Israel to worship idols and, and follow Baalism and all that kind of stuff. And Ahab was a weak, weak man who was the king of Israel, but she was really the power behind the throne. She, she led him, but R.G. Lee described him as she was the coiled adder, the beautiful coiled adder that, that, that squatted by the old toad that, that squatted on the throne of Israel. I thought that's a really, really great picture of Jezebel. Jezebel was seductive. Jezebel was cunning. Jezebel was uh, like a chameleon. Have you ever known anybody like that, that they could run with the rabbits and hunt with the hounds? You know, somebody that could be anything they needed to be in order to, in order to seduce you or to uh, convince you to do something. This was Jezebel. So anytime you see the phrase Jezebel, it's talking about basically a spirit, the spirit of Jezebel. What is the spirit of Jezebel? The spirit of Jezebel is a seductive spirit. So the fact that they allowed that woman Jezebel, as I wrote in your note, a description of her, if you look back there first, she was probably a very attractive woman with a charming personality, persuasive tongue, forceful ideas, and great leadership qualities. She was, it would seem, a woman who could stood her ground and could hold her own against any of the men. Her husband and the board of deacons or the board of elders ate out of her hand. That woman Jezebel, it might not have been her real name, but it fit her like a glove. In other words, she had the spirit of Jezebel. The spirit of Jezebel is alive and kicking today. I don't know if you know that. There are a lot of seductive things that happen in this world by people who can morph themselves almost into any kind of nature they need to have. If you are somebody who is dominant and you need people to submit to you, the spirit of Jezebel will become submissive. Seductively so, but but you'll think that that's a submissive spirit. If you're weak and weak-minded and double-minded, she'll become aggressive and she'll, she'll become an overbearing spirit that leads you in a certain way. If it's sex you like, she'll be sexual. If it's money you like, she'll present herself and present that you might make some money off this. What I'm just saying to you is the spirit of Jezebel is a spirit of seduction who can become anything it needs to be in order to lead in the direction that it wants to lead in. And it had control of this church by some woman who had accepted leadership responsibility in this church. And the Apostle, Paul, uh, the, the Apostle John is saying to us, led by the Spirit, that's the Spirit that controls this church. And she calls herself a prophetess. But she's teaching and she's, and she's seducing the servants, servants to commit spiritual immorality and to be drawn away from Christ. What, what is spiritual immorality? You say, my goodness, what is that? Well, let me just lay this. This is, the, this is the doctrine. When you come to Christ, the Bible teaches that we are actually the bride of Christ. Everybody say, we get married. We get married, spiritually speaking, when I, when I bow my head and I say, Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, come into my heart, change my life, I surrender, I wave the white flag, what you're saying is, will you marry me? And spiritually, you come together and you're married. So you become the bride of Christ. The Bible teaches that the church is the bride of Christ. Well, when, you're, when, when some lover comes along, some seductive spiritual spirit, and it comes along and it seduces you, and you begin to lose the things of Christ in your heart and you begin to go toward the way that this, that this interloper leads you, you actually are committing spiritual adultery against your husband, Christ. This is, this, is why, this is why adultery, this is why being unfaithful to your covenant even with your earthly mate is so devastating. 
because you're actually giving yourself to another. You're giving away what doesn't belong to you. Once you commit yourself spiritually and you're married to someone, you belong to them and they belong to you. You are no longer your own. You are theirs and they are yours. So if I give myself to someone else, I'm giving away something that doesn't belong to me anymore. It belongs to my mate. And the same thing with Christ. Whenever I marry Christ and then I give myself to some foolish belief or some a crazy doctrine or some practice that is not Christ honoring, I actually commit spiritual adultery, spiritual immorality against the Spirit of God. And, and so in Revelation in the church of Thyatira, what's happening is this, this woman who has control of this church, who has the church eating out of her hand, who is smart and productive and beautiful and charming and enhancing and dominating and all of that kind of stuff, and she stands up and she just has them eating out of her hand and she's just leading them down this primrose path away from the things of God and, and they're beginning to be seduced by this and give themselves to the world instead of the things of Christ. And God says, that's enough. That's your problem right there. And so in your own life, I mean, as God would speak to you, I just ask you, how are you doing? I mean, how are you doing with the things of Christ? You say, well, I know a lot about Christ. Well, I'm just asking you, do you follow those things? Are you being charmed away by some thoughts that might make it seem okay? I mean, I can't imagine this crazy world we're living in nowadays. I know it's crazy, and I know it's seductive, and I know it, it, it basically teaches you that certain things are okay. I think the, I think the statistics are that 75%, and, and, and you know, don't Google it right now, but you can after, I, see if I missed it, but I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I mean, things like 75% of the people that are over 30 years old believe it's okay to live together and have sex before you get married that that's perfectly okay, that that's, that's, a, that's, that's a right thing. How many of you know that the Scripture teaches, no, 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 no. You don't have sex before you get married. That's not God's way. See, that may even sound strange to you. You say, Pastor, what? I've never heard that before in my life. Well, there you go, Miss Thyatira or Mr. Thyatira. That just shows you how, how seductive and cunning the spirit of this world is. That's what's happening in lives, and to that, Jesus said, I'm coming as the Son of God. I've had enough of this mess. My eyes see what you're doing, and I'm going to crush you under my feet. That's what's going to happen to you. But yet, it, it, it's so amazing with all of this thing that's going on here, he still offers a chance to repent. I mean, look at this. This is amazing. What are we going to do about it? He says, and I gave her time to repent of her sexual morality, and she did not repent. Now, what about Jezebel and the church? Well, what about this church was God said, look, in spite of the fact that she did everything that I just described, I still have the door open for her to repent. That's the amazing thing, right? I mean, if somebody was doing all this to you, now think about it personally in your own life. If somebody said they loved you, but now they're running with somebody else, directly contrary to you. They're giving themselves to somebody else. They're being led by somebody else. They've turned their back on you. They've stuck, stabbed you in the back. They've spit on you. They don't care about you. They're trying to harm you. They're trying to hurt you. Could you imagine yourself still leaving the door open for them to repent, to turn away from that? This is an, this is an amazing attribute of God. Listen, say this to yourself. God would rather pardon me than punish me. God would rather pardon you than punish you. Punishment is the last resort. He wants to keep the door open as long as he can so that you can have a different direction and change your heart. And to you, listen, to you right now, you're hearing me today, you say, whoo, boy, some bad stuff's coming. It sure is. But the good thing is, it's not here yet, and God still has the door open for you to repent. I gave her a space to repent, but she wasn't interested in repenting, which just simply means that she basically turns her back on God again and says, well, well you know. and she actually took, I think, this is the attitude, she basically took the fact that God was being merciful and grace 
fulfilled, which I hope you're not doing this, that when God doesn't punish you and judge you, you take that as an act of it's okay to keep doing this. I mean, you're taking his grace and his mercy for granted, and you're basically saying, well, if God was so mad about it, he'd punish me. No, God is so merciful and graceful, he's given you one more chance, one last chance. And instead of taking advantage of the grace and mercy of God, you're looking at it as a license that God says it's okay because he hadn't knocked your legs out from under you. I'm just saying, wake up. Look at what God is saying to you. Do you have your ears on is what I'm saying to you. So he said, I gave her time, but she wasn't interested in repenting. She just looked at my act of grace and mercy as an opportunity to keep on with her seductive ways. Indeed, I'll cast her into a sick bed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation. What is he talking about? He's talking about there's a period on this earth called great tribulation. We'll get to it in the book. In the book, there's a seven-year period of time called tribulation. The first three and a half years is called tribulation. The last three and a half years is called great tribulation. Tribulation is going to be horrible, and you'll see it as we get. This is the Star Wars section. It's unbelievable what's going to happen, seriously. But you think that bad? Wait till great tribulation. The last three and a half years, it gets way worser than this. <laughs> it gets way worse. Way worse. So I know my, my English major wife is uh, cringing at the moment. I'm not even looking that way because I don't, I don't want to say. Way, okay, way more worse. Okay. It gets way more worse. <laughs> so what is he saying? He's saying, look, I gave her time to mend her ways, repent, turn around. The word repent means doing about face, quit doing what you're doing, start doing right. That's what repent means. Repent doesn't mean, I'm sorry, I know I did wrong. That's not repentance. That's confession. Repentance is when you actually do something, not just talk about it. When you actually go whoop about face, that is repent. When you do that and walk, walk toward God instead of walking away, that's what God changes in your life. As long as you're just jabbering over here talking about, I know I need this and I'm doing wrong and I'm doing bad and I know I'm not doing right. You're still the same old wicked lost person you've always been. You hadn't done one thing toward God. Don't think you have and don't let Jezebel seduce you that that's okay. That's not okay. You're going to end up in hell. You're going to end up in the great tribulations, what's going to happen to you. Just like these who committed adultery and, 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 and wouldn't turn around, he said, you know, those who commit adultery were there in the great tribulation unless, unless they repent of their deeds. See, God is even at the last minute, he's still holding the door open to give them an opportunity to repent. He said, come on, man, please turn around. Quit walking this way. Let's go. I know you know you need to. I know you sense you need to. I hear you. Your spirit is crying out, change, move away. Don't do this. This is crazy. I'm not going where I need to go. You're not going where I need to go. Come on, turn around. Right up to the last minute, he's given you an opportunity to change. That is the grace of God is all I'm saying. Because if you did all that to me, I'm not so sure I'd give you another chance. I'm telling you. I have trouble with that kind of stuff. <laughs> I'm glad he gave me another chance. But anyway, there you go. And, he, and then he says, and I'll kill her children. This is what he should do. About, what, what do you do about it? Well, you repent, you change, you turn. I will kill her children with death. That sounds gruesome. That doesn't sound like the God of grace and mercy. Well, it's not. It's the God of justice. It's the God of judgment. We're out of grace, baby. We're into what you get, what you deserve. Here's what you deserve. You're going to kill her. He's going to kill your children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the hearts and minds. That just simply means that dis discipline from God, and I want you to listen to this, discipline from God is, is, is not only uh, disciplinary, it is exemplary. And I know you, you said, what's the difference? Well, all right, when God, when God disciplines you, it's not just for the purpose of punishing you, although that is what happens. It is also an example to others who are doing the same thing you're doing so that when they see you disciplined, they might change their ways and say, I don't want that to happen to me. 
And God, see, that even, even that is an opportunity for you to see and change your ways so that the same thing that happened to them won't happen to you. So God says, I'm going to discipline you in a way that everybody who sees it knows it's me, and I hope they look at each other and say, man, I don't want that to happen to me. Let me change. So the word is, if you're going to change from this, you're going to have to change the direction of your life. Now I say to you and to the rest of Thyatira, as many as have not done this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I'll put no other burden on you, but hold fast till I come. Uh, he's basically saying, look, there's some of you that are not listening to this doctrine. You're not being seduced by the world. You're trying to do right. You're trying to live right. You have a heart for me. And I'm just going to tell you, here's what I'm going to tell you to do. Don't put yourself in harm's way. Don't jump up there and try to change this. It's too overpowering. It's too overwhelming. You cannot change this. This is out of control. The only thing that can happen to you is for you to put yourself in harm's way. They're going to kill you. You're going to be destroyed. So I'm just going to tell you this. I'm not going to ask you to do the impossible. How many of you know that God will not ask you to do the impossible? Right? He asks you to do what is possible. Not the impossible. He doesn't ask you to change the world. You can't change the world. You can only witness where you are. You can only be what you've been created to be. You can't change the mind of everybody in the world. So he doesn't ask you to do that because he's not, he's not asking you to go out there and, and do things you can't do. He's just saying, I want you to do what you can do. And he says to them, hey, keep your head down, keep your nose clean, and uh, do right, uh, and, 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 and I'm coming back. Wait, when I get back, I'll take care of things. Don't you try to get yourself out there and get in harm's way. You just keep down. You, you keep on doing what you're doing and make no bones about it. I'm coming back, and when I get there, I'll take care of things. And here's a word to the overcomer. This is a word to the lost people. In every one of these, there's a word to the lost. In other words, somebody that's sitting in the church listening to this letter, what are they supposed to do? Let me give it to you real quickly. And he who overcomes, everybody say, victorious. victorious. And he who's victorious is what that's saying. How do you get victorious? You get victorious like the song that, that our praise team led. You come to the foot of the cross, and the cross gives you victory. So you, what he's saying is, if you're in this church and you don't know me yet, come to me. Come to the cross so I can make you victorious, so I can change your life and make you the overcomer that I created you to be. He says, if you'll do this, notice what he says to them, um, and he who overcomes and keep my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, and they shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, as I also have received from my father. I know that sounds a little bit you know, uh, out of whack, but you've heard of the potter's wheel, right, from the Old Testament. You've heard about being crushed into pieces. Let me just show you where this comes from, and this is amazing, and, and just ca to call your attention, I'm going to read all 12 verses. I'm going to read them quickly, so don't pass. Panic. And I'm not going to preach on them every verse or anything. I just want to read so you can see it. But I'm going to put it up here because I want you to see. I hope this will bring some respect to God in your life and, and the respect for the things of God. Because, listen, on the Isle of Patmos, here is John, the old apostle, 80-something years old, on the Isle of Patmos, out in, in the middle of the, of the ocean, uh, alone on this, on this deserted island except for criminals, this rock out in the middle of nowhere. There's no Bible. There's no books. There's no scrolls. He doesn't have any copy of anything that has been said before. There is no Bible. There's no book of Psalms. There's no writings of Isaiah that he can get to. He's out there by himself with only the Spirit of God speaking to him. But what he says right there is exactly out of the book of Psalms, chapter 2. This is an amazing thing. It just shows you who's responsible for the Word of God, the Spirit of God who speaks the Word to the old man's heart, and he writes it down because he, in Revelation he just said, if you'll let me be an overcomer, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you have a rod of iron, and you're going to smash to pieces the potter's you know, clay and, and rule with a rod of iron. Where does that come from? Well, it comes from Psalms 2 where 
in the book of Psalms, there's a prophecy about when Jesus comes back to this earth, not in the rapture to take us away, but after that to come back to judge the world and set up his kingdom. And you'll hear all about this in the book of Revelation. But notice, this is what Psalms 2 says. I'm going to just read these verses. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. Sounds like a lot of what's going on today, doesn't it? Against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. How does God feel about this? He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. <laughs> You've heard that old thing before. If you want to see God laugh, show him your plans. Well, the whole world's plotting and planning against Christians. Do you know this is going on today? Is this a surprise to you? I mean, look at how Christianity is being treated around the world. Any, any pagan, crazy, uh, anti-Christ religion in the world is being okayed and lifted up. Christianity is the one that's being persecuted and dogged and ridiculed and mocked. The press can't say enough bad things about Christianity. Watch it. It's right there. Every time they get a chance, it's a pot shot against God and the things of God. You think God's upset about it? And he who sits in heaven shall laugh, and the Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in, in his wrath and distress them in his deep pleasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall, is this exactly what he said on the Isle of Patmos? This written thousands and thousands of years before in some obscure place that John had no understanding or reference to whatsoever and certainly did not have a copy sitting beside him on the Isle of Patmos so he could copy the phrase. Look exactly what he said. You shall break them with, an iron, with a rod of iron and you shall dash them to pieces like a potter's wheel. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoicing and trembling. Kiss the sun lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are those who put their trust in him. My goodness, what is the promise to the overcomer? When Jesus comes back in wrath, you're going to be able to be there with him. You're not going to be the one that gets broken. You're going to be the one doing the breaking. How about that? I'd rather be the breaker than the breakee. How about you? And he makes one more promise and I will give him the morning star. Who is the morning star? Jesus Christ is the morning star. Revelation 22, I put it in your notes. You can look it up. He says, I am the morning star. So you know what Jesus is saying? Jesus is saying, I'm, and I'm quitting right now, okay? So hang on. Jesus says, I'm the morning star. In other words, I'm all you need. When you possess me, you possess everything. Let me just show you what that means, just kind of a little concept. Uh, there's, a, there's an old story, a little like a little Roman proverb kind of story, and the story is this, that there was this rich Roman ruler who passed away. And in his will, he said, I'm going to leave everything to my slave, Marcellus. I'm going to allow my son to have only to choose only one item from my estate. Marcellus has it all. The son gets one choice of one item in the estate. And you know what the son chose? Marcellus. The son says, I choose Marcellus. Because you see, the choosing of Marcellus means he gets everything. I'm saying to you, that's what Jesus is saying to you. Jesus is saying, you choose me, you get everything. To possess me means to possess everything. I'm the morning star, and I'll give myself to you. This is a wonderful promise from the Lord. I'm just saying to you that no matter how far gone you may think you are, Jesus says, there's still time for you. Turn. Come on, choose me, because if you will, I'll give you myself, which will give you everything. Christ is still speaking. The door is still open. You say, man, I feel this. Well, good. That means the Holy Spirit's there ministering and he's talking to you and you need to hear him and hear what he says to you. You need to turn right now while you still have time.
That's the word of the Lord to the church at Thyatira. So why don't you stand? Thank you.